Hi, good evening um, guests. Uh, we'll be starting in about a minute's time, just giving time for um, our guests to join us. So about a minute's time and we'll get started with today's um, inaugural lecture. Okay, just uh, a few more minute seconds and we'll get started. Just waiting for a few more people to join. Okay, I think we can make a start. So um, on behalf of the University of Wolverhampton and our Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeff Lay, I'm really delighted to welcome you to the inaugural DLA Piper Lecture on Social Mobility. Uh, my name is Sutnin Panasar and I'm the head of the law school at the university and I'll be hosting today's event. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Social Mobility, the Role of Business and Their Legal Advisors in Tackling Some of the Society's Biggest Challenges. And today's lecture will be presented by Sandra Wallace, our very own Sandra Wallace, who is a graduate from the University of Wolverhampton Law School, graduating in 1991. And today, Sandra represents a shining example of the university's widening participation as gender and what successes that brings. And I'm sure Sandra will talk a bit about that in her talk. Um, she's not just only an ambassador for the law school, but a great role model for our students. And if you get the opportunity to actually come and visit our law school, you'll see Sandra's picture, one of many successful alumni at the entrance of the law school. And we're really proud of that. Um, Sandra is a Pro-Chancellor for Social Mobility at the University of Wolverhampton and Managing Director for the UK and Europe uh, DLA Piper Operations and Interim Co-Chair of the Government Social Mobility Commission. Um, she's very passionate about obviously today's topic and will be obviously discussing obviously her role um, in obviously promoting that. She offers strategic and commercial advice on businesses, reorganizations, executive disputes at really high level. Um, and so we're delighted, obviously, to have Sandra as an ambassador of the law school and a pro chancellor for the university. Um, so I'll be hosting the event today. If you do have any uh, questions for Sandra or indeed any one of the speakers today, please can you put those into the QA uh, section of the webinar? Um, this is a public platform, so I'll just remind you not to share personal emails and personal information in the chats. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to now invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeff Blair, to say a few words about the university and its 2030 strategy. So over to you, Jeff. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. And thank you very much for being with us. And thank you in particular to DLA Piper for enabling this, this this evening. Thank you. Uh, the university has recently developed a new strategic plan, 10-year strategic plan, which is called Vision 2030. It's an ambitious plan. It's a plan that seeks to place the university very much at the heart of its business and professional community, as well as the broader communities around us. It focuses on our students, it focuses on our place, and it seeks to make a real difference and, you know, social mobility is a key part of that. We're a university which has over 50% of our students from a BAME background, over 50% come are mature students. And, you know, we have some of the, sort of the highest proportion of students on low income in the country. And they all contribute to a dynamic and really brilliant culture within the university. And what we seek to do is to make a real difference to people's lives. And that's what's really important about the University of Wolverhampton. We transform people's lives by through giving them an opportunity to improve their individual life chances. Now, we're delighted to have a pro-chancellor for social mobility. And we're delighted um, that, that Sandra's taken up that, that, 
particular challenge and we look forward to working with her really, really closely on this, given her national role in, in this agenda. So, and we're also pleased that this is actually some of your first public engagement as pro-chancellor, so thank you very much for this. And I now hand over to the Dean of the Faculty, Michal Barden, to say a few words about the brilliant Wolverhampton Law School. Thank you very much, Jeff. And as Jeff said, I'm Michal Barden. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Business and Social Science, within which sits the law school. And as a law graduate myself, I'm delighted to be part of this law school hosted event this evening. Before we hear from Sandra as our guest speaker, I just wanted to very briefly give you some information on University of Wolverhampton Law School. The law school has more than 50 years of experience in teaching law and has played an important role in both academic legal education and professional legal education for many, many years. Uh, thousands of our graduates have gone on to forge their careers within the legal profession and outside of it. Currently, we have over 400 law students in the school from a diverse range of backgrounds, studying from undergraduate through to PhD level, supported by our experienced team of law school staff from a variety of academic and professional backgrounds. The school really prides itself on practice based learning and a key part of our offer is to ensure that students have opportunities for placements in law firms and other legal organisations such as the Crown Prosecution Service as part of their course. It's particularly important that we offer these placements to students who have no family background in law and who may not otherwise be able to access these opportunities. A hallmark of these placements which the law school offers is that they are real opportunities that enable students to make a difference it's worth just mentioning some examples. So the university works with Wolverhampton City Council Welfare Rights Service, aiding vulnerable members of the local community with benefits appeals to the Upper Tier Tribunal. This gives students a real opportunity to gain practical legal experience for their future careers. But the law school has also been running a legal advice centre in the city centre for more than 10 years, offering legal advice to the local community and this has led to students obtaining positions as paralegals and trainees directly from that experience. And finally, I'm delighted that Sukhninder as head of the law school has been instrumental in ensuring that the law school is a founding member of the recently launched Windrush Justice Clinic in Wolverhampton with law students volunteering and offering legal advice to those people who access the clinic. Um, we're really proud of the fact that our students have gone on to successful roles in the legal sector. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce one of our alumni this evening, Sandra Wallace, who, as you've heard, is Joint Managing Director for the international law firm DLA Piper. This evening, Sandra is here to talk to us on the topic of social mobility, the role of businesses and their legal advisors in tackling some of society's biggest challenges. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Sandra Wallace. Thank you, Jeff, uh, Michal and Sakninda. That's, uh, I'm very pleased to be here and it's, um, it's quite a privilege to be talking to you in this inaugural event um, and in a role as pro-chancellor um, pro and, and former alumni. So um, I'm truly honoured to be speaking to you today. It's quite clear to me that um, this is a, a really um, special establishment and not only from my own experience, but from how the university has developed um, over the years since I attended, which feels like a long time ago, but I don't feel that old. Um, the issues that I wanna talk about today are really dear to my heart. Um, they talk to my own personal story, but also uh, as a proud graduate of Wolverhampton University, I think this is a university that embodies the opportunity to engender social mobility and speak to and service the community in which it serves. So a little bit about me. Um, I am one of six children, number five of six, and the first person in my family to go to university. Um, my parents came to this country um, from Jamaica in the 1950s. Um, my dad was a painter and decor decorator. My mother was a, a cleaner. In fact, she was a cleaner at the school that I actually attended, which, as you can imagine, at times was, was a bit of a challenge. 
Um, we lived in Birmingham, a place that I've always lived, um, in a three-bedroom masonette, and then in the council house. Um, and I worked really hard at school. Um, I, I'm proud to say that it was in an environment where not many people aspired to um, get jobs beyond what their parents did or, or, or um, in low-paid work or just didn't believe that there was much out there for them. I, I didn't, I wanted more. I felt that there was a better life out there for me. I didn't want to continue in the life of poverty that we were living. Um, and I, it was really important to me to try and, and better myself. So after leaving school, um, I attended a local uh, further education college and then um, took a year out um, to convince my parents that I could actually earn a living who were a bit nervous about me going to university and not bringing money home. And then finally, I, I, I went to university. And when I was applying for places uh, to attend a university, I did visit Russell Group universities, and, and I visited one in particular not a million miles away from Birmingham. And I arrived in the lecture hall, and I was one of a handful of black students at the time that were applying for law and in that lecture hall to hear more about the course. And also, it was clear there was um, the wealth and the know-how and the sort of experience of applying and going to uh, to visit a university was evident in the room. And I just felt I couldn't I couldn't go there. I didn't think I'd fit in. I would all, it'd already been a struggle at school, and I just didn't want the next three years to be a struggle. When I visited Wolverhampton, it was completely different. Um, it was diverse. It was welcoming. It was down to earth. And it just felt like this was going to be a place where would better um, fulfill what I wanted to achieve in terms of enjoying my education. So I was offered a place elsewhere, but I didn't attend. Instead, I came to Wolverhampton and the rest is history. Um, I felt for the first time truly engaged in education and felt that I could really achieve beyond all the expectations that had been um, leveled at me um, up until that time. It was truly the best decision I've ever made um, and I just don't believe I'd be here uh, where I am today without the the way that the university made me feel the opportunities that it gave me and the opportunities to study law at a high standard which I thoroughly enjoyed and yet um, no one is more surprised than me still that many years later I've been invited back to be a pro chancellor and give a lecture as I said on something very dear to my heart on social mobility I often tell myself that I need to better embrace um, the achievements and be more, that I've, uh, I've had in my career and where I am now in the leadership role and be more comfortable in my skin, um, uh, not only with the successful legal career that I've managed to um, uh, reach, but also being at a global law firm, which has been very special to me and very dear to me um, in the time that I've worked there since um, qualifying. Um, but more important to me um, is that I can't allow myself to get too comfortable or complacent about doing what I encourage, I need to do to encourage, inspire, cajole, and generally make a nuisance of myself um, when making the case for improving the lives from, uh, of lives of people from more deprived backgrounds or less privileged backgrounds and ensure, as I found, that someone's past doesn't determine their future. So why should we all care about social mobility? And um, this is, as I said, something that I think is a topic that is becoming more prevalent. People are talking about it a lot more. It's ubiquitous in political conversations, business, the education sector. People have various opinions on it. Um, regardless of the way it's spoken about, the only way we can progress um, sorry, in social mobility, is if we can combine our own lived experiences and our ambitions with concrete solutions and attainable outcomes. I feel passionately that we need to address poverty, deprivation, inequality, social and economic bias, and that has never been more pressing. We see campaigners like Marcus Rashford, um, uh, and we say, well, is that a one-hit wonder? But what they are trying to address and what this lecture is trying to address 
that this is one of society's biggest challenges. So what I want to do this evening is appeal for really a collaborative action from the legal sector, business, and the future generation, which I hope are all listening today. I'd like everyone listening to think about how we take the social mobility story and diversity and inclusion more generally beyond what sometimes people say to me, especially in my world as an employment lawyer, is a HR story. We need to win the minds of leaders, senior managers, directors and CEOs so we can help shape the future success of your businesses and our educational establishments and those that aspire to progress in life. If anyone today is thinking that they don't see a clear way to help the case of social mobility, then I, that's what I'd like to address today. One of the first steps in improving social mobility is to identify thing, where things stand today. And it's fair to say we are not there yet. I look at my own legal world and I think it's right that if we're gonna challenge others, we are happy to have the spotlight shown on ourselves. Um, and despite all the interventions that have been put in place over the years, there are still damning statistics regarding profession, progression across professional firms. The Bridge Group, um, who does a lot of work in this area, in their report in 2020 on social economic diversity and progression to, to partner in the law, highlighted several things that are still shows we've got somewhere to go. But those particularly who identify as why it progressed to partner nearly two years more quickly than those from other ethnic groups. Those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds take a year and a half longer on average to reach partner, and in many cases, it's a lot longer if they stay in the profession. Um, females take nearly a year longer than males to reach partner, and black and female employees are much more likely to be from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. It's my view that business cannot and will not prosper in a world with systematic environmental and social failures. In business, if you view your people as your primary assets that I'm told all the time as an employment lawyer, then the social mobility agenda, along with inclusion more generally, is integral to the future of work and business. So I wanna look at what we can collectively do um, I believe it is vitally important to share stories of success, but also of hardship and resilience. And it's, so, it's something I do a lot of my time. It's it got more comfortable with sharing my story. And when people understand that it's not straightforward, it's not easy, but there are more and more opportunities and there are more and more people working to improve opportunities, then I think it's an encouragement for all. I know there are business leaders, educators, students, business people, who have never shared their personal journeys for fear of looking out of place or feeling their perceptions of them will change. I know that's something that I felt for many years, not saying ashamedly where I went to university because I thought if you didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge, it wouldn't be acceptable. Not saying that I haven't uh, got, been on holiday, been abroad till I was in my 20s, not been in a car um, until I was 15, 16. You know, you're ashamed of sharing those experiences. And a lot of business leaders that I've come across have, have, uh, have hidden those stories. And there's many people that do that. But actually, the more we share our stories, the more we should share our successes, the more people think, believe that things are achievable for them. But when you actually open up, as I said about personal journey, so many people tell you that it's helped them realize they can achieve their ambitions and much more. So we need to talk more vocally about the problems and also about the solutions, which I want to talk to you a bit about today, or at least some of the things I, find, I think that it's important that we try and think about. Um, I'm going to address the topic of the lecture today and articulate some of the steps business and their legal advisors can take. But before I, take, before I do that, I wanted to appeal to the students that are on this call and starting out or starting out the professional careers. Whether you're studying law or business or some other subject and you're thinking about your future career choices, you should consider your, the need to challenge and hold employers to account if they want your skill and they want your talent. You hold the power to make them make a difference. Students need to see yourselves, you need to see yourselves as leaders and to think about creating the world you want to live in. 
Reducing inequalities in our world will be fundamental to driving sustainable futures for all. And people across the UK experience disparity in a range of ways. We're not trying to compete um, with disadvantage. We, the, there's an intersection um, in how people experience disadvantage, including rural and urban disparities, household poverty, gender diver, um, discrimination, ethnic minority discrimination, migrant status, disability. These things are not separate or distinct or in silos. There are a range of ways that someone can be impacted. Business are drivers of economic growth and contribute in multiple ways to functioning and flourishing societies. They can also, however, exacerbate inequalities, including perpetuating bias and discrimination. And for students at Wolverhampton, understanding structural inequality in your studies, particularly in law, along with the root cause of stagnant social mobility, will mean that you can help challenge, disrupt, and ultimately improve society for all. So be leaders and understanding this agenda and question the employers that you're going to see when you're looking for new opportunities, when you're looking for roles. It's part of your responsibility to ask those difficult questions and ensure that the employers are doing their part in dealing with the inequalities that might exist. We are at a crossroads, it's certainly the case. As we start to recover from COVID, we understand inequality like never before. And we have, as, as we have stakeholders genuinely looking at how they can be part of the change, like no other time in history. The generation currently at university will have a great opportunity and responsibility to hold governments and business to account because they are listening. And if they're not, they won't survive. And to those who, just like me, were living or trying to uh, just avoid the poverty trap and want something better, even though you may not know what it is, what better is. I didn't know at the time, even when I did a law degree, whether it better was going to be being a lawyer or what I, where I'd end up. I'd still say to you, the tide is turning in your favour. And we must work to ensure that barriers, even if we accept there will always be some in life, and not simply due to background. So to business, if I can take a moment to talk to you. Many people say to me, we shouldn't need a business case for improving social mobility. But the reality is in order to maintain strong workplaces and economic prosperity, we, need, we do need employers to appreciate that the, the, the case for social mobility is just as important as looking at your budget, your bottom line, your P&L, your innovation strategy, your skill shortages. It's just as much a part of business as that. Diverse businesses are profitable businesses, and I'm sure you'd have heard that before. But we also know that diverse teams improve customer satisfaction, improve client approval, and give you access to a widening talent pool. Often people talk to me about the skill shortages, and they're ignoring people on their doorsteps that with the right skills, that with the opening of the right opportunities, would it be only too willing to join their organisations? It's where we're looking that is the issue. We know that employees from lower socioeconomic backgrounds outperform, on, on average, outperform their more advan advantaged peers. We also know that diverse teams lead to improved employee engagement and support the well-being of colleagues. When companies foster a more positive, inclusive environment, 83% of millennials are found to be more actively engaged with that business. And 43% of businesses with more diverse workforces have higher profits. I can certainly testify to that in my business as we've diversified, as we've encouraged, as we've looked at making sure our leadership team is diverse and strategically relevant in, in, in those terms, that that business has gone from strength to strength. So it's absolutely essential to understand that the case for improving social mobility is not just about money. The case for in-work progression is not all about expensive training or having big outlays to in order to look at this agenda. To really make a difference in social mobility, the business community just needs a mindset change. It needs to think about where it goes to find its next, its future talent. So where do we start? 
some of the, the, the tips I want to talk about are not rocket science. They're things that business can take on board, even if not all of it, even if in these difficult COVID times, business have struggled. There's, there's simple steps they can take in order to increase access to their businesses, open people's eyes to what opportunities are out there and to ensure that people can apply to your businesses and look for those opportunities, even if they think to themselves, this is not for them or it's not what they feel is expected of them. If we can open their eyes to what's out there, then it can make it's part of the battle. So local outreach, visit local schools, beyond the schools that your children might go to. One of the things I've often talked about is employers setting up stands at parents' evenings. I know in these COVID times, that's not, that's not, that's more difficult, but we will get back to a stage where there's opportunities for business to go into schools. It's opening the eyes of parents and teachers and students into what is, what's available to them. So go into those schools um, and talk about the job market and what's available. Also talk to students, tell, uh, find out what they believe are the barriers to success, find out what they believe are the barriers to them succeeding. Pick those schools with a high proportion of free school meals, because that's where you'll find a lot of children that want to improve themselves, want to succeed, but often don't know how. They don't have the grounding and the network or the parents um, who've often operated in professional or other environments that can help them succeed. Help with CV writing, interview techniques. There are lots of organisations that run programmes across the UK. Speakers for Schools is one of them. But the Social Mobility Commission, of which I'm part and I'll return to, has an online directory that can help you find a partner to work with. Inspire students to consider other career paths. Get involved with local charities. Before schools went back into the classrooms, many students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds struggled to access online learning. There are some wonderful charities supporting a campaign to end laptop poverty. It's estimated there are millions of spare laptops sitting in British homes and workplaces. Donate these to charities and support learning. I also heard during lockdown of, a, of an estate agency that during lockdown was offering quiet places to work in their estate agents that were closed at the time so that students that were in environments at home that were difficult to work in and concentrate, they had different environments in which they could work and study when, when other opportunities weren't open to them. So think outside the box for opportunities to assist. When you think about work experience opportunities, offer work experience to students from those schools and make it meaningful. Explore their experience and ambitions. Understand, as I said, what they say is the barriers, um, not necessarily what you might think or what you perceive to be the issues. Put in place support beyond the work experience, whether you can follow up, offer mentorship to ensure long-term support. One of the things we do at DLA Piper is from school age through to university, our offer program, what we should call Head Start, which is offering networking opportunities, mentoring opportunities, CV writing, and things that are going to assist them throughout their educational um, uh, career so that they can get the best start when they're looking for jobs. Pay travel costs up front. Some of the most basic things can hinder people from taking work experience opportunities, having the bus fare to get to your place of work, having the uh, money to find um, uh, sandwiches during the day. Ensure that people and they spend their time on your work sites and they understand what your business is about. If you offer interns, uh, which is again an excellent way that people can un understand your business. If it's possible, offer a salary, preferably the national living wage. Um, young people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds might have part-time jobs that contribute to household incomes. That was the case with myself before I went to university. I couldn't have taken up an internship if I'd have wanted to before going to university because I needed to be earning and bringing money into the house. Um, they cannot necessarily afford to do that with unpaid internships. When we're considering the other routes to uh, careers, then apprenticeship route for young talent is also a crucial part. And we're working um, as, as part of the commission to make apprenticeships more uh, directed more towards so people from socio, um, poor socioeconomic backgrounds. 
So we challenge the government on that. We know that apprenticeships are not straightforward, but also think about um, apprenticeships if your business is able to offer them. If you have a graduate placement scheme, widen the reach of those you recruit from. Don't just recruit from Russell Group universities. When establishments like Wolverhampton take students from the local community, those that need to do, as we say, part-time work and have diverse positions and also show resilience by studying and working, having care and responsibilities, sometimes all at the same time. Don't necessarily always go for top grades. Look for potential rather than polish. Again, that's something in the legal profession that we've been guilty of. And explore contextualised recruitment. A lot of candidates look the same on paper. They may have similar qualifications, or they may not. They may have different qualifications. The reality is that for someone who has been harder to achieve, what others might have been able to achieve because of home circumstances, life circumstances, then what they have achieved may be much more significant than someone with a higher grade because they have had to work so much harder to get where they've got to. I could speak again for myself. I, I didn't have the top grade, grades. Everybody always assumes that if you were a, a lawyer at DLA Piper, you must have got triple A's and all the rest of it. I didn't have those grades. And it was someone seeing beyond the, that that helped me to get where I am. If you don't know where you are currently, then it's, then it's always worth um, looking at the data that you hold on the socio-economic um, makeup of your organization. And to do that, track data. Collect early data, not only in early careers, but on progression in your senior leadership. Um, diversity data is not, it's not something that's um, unusual to organizations, but perhaps in many, not many organizations will collect the data on social mobility journeys. The Social Mobility Commission, as I said, the government organization of which I am part, um, at their website, socialmobilityworks.org, gives guidance on how you can start to track data on social mobility in order to see where you are as a business and what more you can be doing. And there's a key question to ask, what was the parental occupation of, the, of your um, worker uh, when they were 14 years old? It's a very simple question. It's a very simple um, uh, metrics to judge. And it also means that um, you can, in your organizations, you can really pilot and champion what you're trying to do in asking that question, not just of people that from the lower socioeconomic backgrounds to give you that information, but for everyone to give you that information so you have a real good picture of what's out there. The data will give you the guidance and where you need to make changes to support colleagues from all backgrounds in not only getting into your business, but also progressing in your business. So do visit the socialmobilityworks.org website to get more information on collecting that data. And I want to turn finally to what legal advisors can do. As legal advisors, we have a duty to hold our clients to account. And I'm proud to work for a firm that is championing social mobility, both internally and within our clients. My work at DLA Paper has grown from leading the UK employment group, um, an area of expertise, that's my area of expertise, and my passion for employment law grew at Wolverhampton. Um, and we advise business, and we want to advise business to, to be ethically and socially um, as strong as they can be. Um, DLA Piper has not stood still with the knowledge that socioeconomic diversity is not at, at the levels it should be in the legal and professional services, and it's working hard to bridge the gap. It's allowed me as a firm um, to give up time to further this agenda, not just for law firms, but for wider society with my role as interim chair of the Social Mobility Commission. What you've got to ask yourself as an employer is do we value our people who take on roles that further this agenda or other diverse agendas? People that care about and want to make things better for others because we, we should be encouraging that in our organization. Ultimately, DLA Piper has a global reach and the power to be a global influencer in our field. Therefore, I believe we have a responsibility to encourage business to do more for the cause of social mobility. What we've tried to do is partner with clients 
as they move beyond incremental change and implement transformational solutions. So there's many clients at the very start of this journey, and there's many clients that are really embracing uh, uh, this agenda and really want to transform their organizations. We are playing our part in helping clients build new business models and economic and market systems that favor sustainable companies. And we use our position to advise government on legislative change if companies do not see the business case themselves. Whilst legislation by itself does not necessarily always move the dial, one of the oldest pieces of legislation we have out there is the Equal Pay Act of 1970, and yet we still see a big gender pay gap. But the fact is, it is a tipping point. It's a point by which we can see business says, OK, if you're not going to do something by yourself, we will, we will work with you as a government to do, to, to do something about it. It tips the balance for change. The law and the lawyers lead the way and lead by example with employers, with our clients and, and with government. We also need to use our position to influence policy and the conversation. One example of this is the City of London Corporation Task Force, that DLA Piper is strongly involved with over, over 80 organisations, financial and professional services, working with Her Majesty's Treasury and Bays. This task force is going to look at collaboration in order to improve socio-economic diversity in the sector. And we are working um, in to achieve that, to come up with recommendations for business for 2022. So we can use our influence in many ways as lawyers to forward this agenda. The work is not done, and I don't say DLA Piper or any organisation in the legal sphere is perfect, but we know that this will improve our business ultimately and in the long run. Let me end by saying I never wanted to be a role model. Um, when I joined DLA Piper, I just wanted to do my own thing, work hard. I wasn't looking for recognition. I didn't even know what levels of success I'd achieve. But then I started to realize that being a role model wasn't actually about me. If I was able to succeed through hard work, some good fortune, but predominantly hard work, then I had an obligation that people coming behind me were seeing the opportunities, had opportunities opened up for them, and I wasn't the last one on the ladder. I needed to send the lift back down. I believe that obligation rests with all of us as teachers, students, employers, employees, governments, the general public. The promise has to be that our past doesn't dictate our future. It's a cause I will be fighting for as long as I can and as long as people will listen. And I'm thanking, I'm thankful to you for listening to me today. Thank you. I'd like to hand back. Linda. Okay, thank you, um, Sandra, for what was a really, really um, interesting, insightful, inspiring talk. Um, and, and I can assure you that in today's webinar, there are a significant number of students, uh, not just from the law school, but across the university who would have been touched by a lot of uh, what you've said. Um, so, and it's also great to see the work that DLA Piper are doing on social mobility. Now, just to remind um, uh, guests, if there are any questions, can you put them in the question and answer uh, section of the webinar and we'll get to those. We've received, Sandra, a considerable number of questions even before the event. And um, I apologize to everyone uh, if I can't specifically ask your question. I'll try to ask as many as I can. Um, you've already addressed a lot of the uh, questions that have been raised about the, the things that leaders and employers should be doing. Uh, you talked about some of the biggest challenges on social mobility. Um, you've addressed issues relating to businesses and how they can drive social mobility. Um, perhaps I can start off uh, a question that has come from, um, from, from, I suspect, a student. And the question is, um, what is one thing you wish you would have known and done differently at the beginning of your career path? If there is, what is it and what advice would you give to young students now? I think I would have not given myself such a hard time. Um, I feel that I didn't believe I belonged in the room. I, I, I felt um, a bit of an imposter in that room. And so it held me back because I, she says, as global leader of a global law firm, but it, <laughs> at the beginning, I just felt that my voice wasn't important enough. I didn't recognize that I'd got where I got to 
because of hard work and I had the right to be in the same room as everybody else. And I think that actually can mean that you close your own doors to opportunity, that you don't go for things that you might, that you you, you take a step back and you, and you hold back. And I think it would, just, it would be to say, Sandra, you deserve to be in the room. You deserve what you've achieved. And you need to stop thinking that because you didn't go to all the right schools and you don't know, you know, all the, the latest ski resorts um, and all the things that people talk about when you get into law at the beginning doesn't mean you don't deserve to be in the room. So I would, I would definitely tell myself to have more confidence and to be proud of what I've achieved. Thanks, Sandra. That's a really, really, really good um, point for our students. Um, another question we've had is, what would you say was the biggest barrier to your success and how can others approach this to succeed themselves? I know you've touched a bit about this in your talk, but if you could just elaborate a bit on that. So was there sort of like a particular barrier which you faced, you know, in terms of getting where you've got today uh, and, and uh, what approach, you know, students can take to deal with those barriers? I think it's, it's knowing what's out there because I think one of the big, biggest barriers I faced was understanding um, the legal world I was going into. I was very naive. Um, I had no one to really talk, show me the way. I had no one saying, oh, if you, if you do this work experience and do the, you know, if you do this, if you go to these sort of talks and so on, you'll be much more uh, um, fluent. When you go for interview, you'll look much more informed. I think it, the, one of the biggest barriers is the lack of information. And that's why I say People need to go into schools. They need to try and open up opportunities and let people know what's available and what's out there. Because if you don't know what's out there, you don't know what you're missing. And so one of the barriers that I faced was just literally the sort of ignorance and I'm not understanding what was out there. I think I also faced an assumption that um, I, I wouldn't succeed. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, having gone to Wolverhampton, a lot of people were very dismissive of not going to a Red Brick University. Uh, especially when you wanted to go into law. And I think there was a lot of um, prejudice in that respect. So that was fighting against that prejudice and having to prove myself um, was, quite, was quite something that was quite a big barrier for me at the beginning. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask uh, one more question from the questions that we, was, what, that we had from pre-submitted. And as I said, there's, there's lots here and we won't be able to get through all of them, but we're happy to, and, and I know you said you would be happy to um, you know, answer any questions post the webinar. Um, so in your role, obviously, as the interim co-chair of the Government Social Mobility Commission, and bearing that in mind, so, um, excuse me, it's quite a long question, but one of the <laughs> questions we had, which was this, and that is, is the work on social mobility a useful political mask that may benefit a few, but is ultimately doomed, given the baked-in structural inequalities across our society that successive governments seem to have little interest acknowledging or acting upon? Wow, that is a big question. I mean, I think there is definitely inbaked dis um, disadvantage. There is definitely a lot of things out there that we need to focus on. In our work as a Social Mobility Commission, we see that um, the disadvantage can start very early from early years and opportunity um, for early years, for example, people that are in the care sector and working to improve um, students, um, uh, ch very children's early years experience, that, that the, the disadvantages that exist in pay and other things mean that that can be a very difficult environment right through to FE funding, which uh, we know is, 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 is still severely under-resourced. Um, so there's lots of inbate disadvantage, but what I would I would paint a much more positive picture People are waking up to the inequalities that exist. I can see that just from the task force I talked about, where 80 organisations, top financial institutions are all saying this, isn't, this can't go on. Um, we can't keep the same people um, in, in place from coming from the same backgrounds in place uh, for a sustainable future. So I can see a real momentum now in business from government it's my job, your job, students' jobs as commission to hold people's feet to the fire and make sure that we don't um, rest on our laurels. But I genuinely believe we can make a difference in this area if we, if we, if we try. 
Okay, okay. So we'll move on to some of the questions that have come through from today's audience. And one of the first ones is, thank you, Sandra, for sharing your experience. You mentioned something about the need to challenge and disrupt. When students challenge malpractices or unfair practices, they are overpowered by staff. The same goes for staff. They are silenced by more senior staff. It is worst if you're a black woman who is raising the issues. What is your take on that? And what would be your advice to the higher education sector and business to address this very real issue? I think um, there has to be a period of reflection. I can't speak for all institutions, but organizations have to ask themselves difficult questions. What are the mechanisms for people to speak up in our organizations? How do we encourage that? How, we do, how do we listen? How do we try and understand context? How do we try and address those things? Very often we have very procedural steps, I know from as an employer, employment lawyer, how to handle grievance, how to handle um, people that are, are upset in their organisations. Actually, a lot of progress then can be made if we actually take the time to stop and listen and understand, not even with a grievance in mind, but just what is your personal experience? Some of what I've talked about in the talk today, what is your personal, what's your lived experience? What holds you back? Um, what holds this organisation back? And I think if we're open to have those conversations, if we're open to what we might hear when we have those conversations, then we can start to deal with those, some of those inherent biases and, and things that cause us concern. I've often heard people categorise as aggressive or, or, or overpowering or you need to tone it down when you, when you, when you express yourself. And I, I hear all of that. People need to stop and listen and think about that, that sort of bias and, 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 and try and drive that listening and reflective approach. I, I can't say that we'll, we'll, we'll cure all ills in that way, but I really do think we, if we take the time to listen and not just go through the procedural steps uh, that sometimes institutions rely on, the fear of stepping outside the mark, then um, we would actually make more of a difference. Yeah, that, and that's absolutely right. You know, the, the, taking the time to listen to somebody and understand you know the context uh, a really uh, good advice uh, uh, next question a really interesting one um, as an employment uh, partner so the question is often black people have to work harder whether this is at university or the place uh, placement or at work and often they have to work for free to resolve institutional racism and no additional salary this is a new form of exploitation being practiced in many places so as an employment partner lawyer what are your personal professional opinion on this and what do you think can be done to stop the exploitation of black people to work for free? Well, this is what I've just said a part of my speech. I mean, I think a lot of people offer internships. A lot of people are saying that's a way of getting to our organisation. And we've really got to say to ourselves, can, should we be doing free, expecting people to do free internships? What does it mean for that individual if they want the experience? But then on the other hand, they've got to... On the other hand, they've got to they've got to give up a part-time job that they might already have, or or as a work that they paid employment that they have. So we've really got to look at that, and I, th I also think we've got to challenge government on what is available for students as they go through their educational lives that will support them fundamentally to improve their position. There is no doubt that um, uh, that, that black um, and other um, ethnic minority groups, Bangladeshi, for example, as uh, some of the work of Social Mobility Commission has found, have, have faced particular disadvantage, and we need to try and address that. And employers have a part to play in that. You know, it, you, if you want change, if you want to drive real change, then you have to ask yourself what opportunities are we giving to people, and, and what are, at what cost are we expecting it? And, and ultimately, uh, it may be that we have to push push for more legislation in this respect. Um, and that's something that we are looking at as a, as a commission. Um, but but being no doubt that the employers voluntarily can make a big step in the right direction. Okay, excellent. Um, our next question is from our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Julia Clark, and she thanks you for a great talk and a call to disruption. Uh, professions such as law and accountancy have offered roots for many of us. Do you have any views on how we protect these given the structural changes that we are seeing in the world of work, such as the impact of technology that may result in greater funding into fewer opportunities? As a law firm, we are, we are um, DLA Piper is investing in a lot of technologies, disruptive technologies, that the business of law will change, that we are relying on AI, 
to do a lot of our work that we are looking at um, different technologies that will look at how we how we bill, how we interact with clients, how we make an assessment of how a judge might make a decision based on algorithms. So there's no doubt that these things are being disrupted. D disruptors are in our industry, but it's necessary for change. We are law, the business of law will get left behind if lawyers don't adapt to that. However, the business of law is about relationships. The business of law is about judgment. It's about coming to the table and, and, and a lawyer and an accountant, or whatever the professional might be, bringing their expertise ultimately to the table. So there might be um, AI and technologies that will enhance our ability to do our roles, but that need for judgment, that need for um, the holding and partnering, I believe will always be there. We shouldn't be fear fearful of technologies. We should look at how we adapt technologies to ensure that we are part of the solution for our clients alongside those technologies. And as a business, DLA Piper investing in some, some of those things has not seen us reduce our headcount, has not seen us reduce uh, our numbers. In, in fact, we want more specialist lawyers um, that are offering law and, and working with those technologies to, to service their clients better. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so please do continue to um, ask further questions. We do have um, time. Um, so let's just move on to um, some more questions, uh, Sandra. So the next one here we have is, what can young adults, students, or people starting out in their careers do on a daily basis to help social mobility? Is it something we should talk about more openly with our peers? So I think you've addressed this, but maybe you want to just add a bit more yeah, to that. I think we should. I think you'd be surprised how many people warm to the stories. I was talking very recently to someone at the London Stock Exchange that was asked to be a part of the task force that I talked about. And when it was announced that he was going to be part of the task force, he was inundated with people in his organisation that said, that was my, my personal, I've got a social mobility story. I didn't know the organisation was interested in this so much. I, I want to talk to, I would like to talk to like-minded people. I'd like to help. So absolutely sharing the story is, is, is about opening the door to this conversation and people realising actually what, may, what was successful for me? How did I make it work? How did I overcome those barriers? And how can I lead people that are coming into the organisation that would help this? I remember a corporate lawyer at DLA Piper opening up for the first time about her story. She'd never done so. No one had a clue. They'd always assumed she'd come from a very privileged background, just be, for dint of the way she spoke. We make assumptions about people and we shouldn't. So we should have those conversations. And I think what we student, what you can do in those respect is, is to challenge your organisations, as I've said, and look at what initiatives that you, that, that you as students think would make a difference in that organisation to ensure that people from um, disadvantaged backgrounds, less privileged backgrounds can actually um, succeed in that workplace. So I think it's op opening the conversation and looking at where we can help. Okay, that's really, really um, um, useful uh, advice there. Um, so our Dean of the Faculty, Michal, talked about a bit about the law school and, um, you know, we've developed um, a number of placements, uh, the legal clinic, uh, the welfare benefits, more recently, you know, um, the Windrush clinic um, to enhance the students' experience. So the question in the uh, chat box here or the question and answer box here is, do you have any advice for students who are starting in the Legal Advice Centre? So we have the Legal Advice Centre where we have our students going specifically regarding taking clients. Is there any specific advice you've got for these students who, who are in this webinar today? Um, I think it's a great way of cutting your teeth is, is, is one thing I would say. And it's a fantastic service. I remember doing that myself at Wolverhampton many years ago. And it was it helped me to understand some of the inequalities that existed in, in and, and you can take those into organizations you can take that knowledge and that experience into the way you deal with people into the way you interact with people understanding what some of the hardships that people go through so i think when you're in those advice centers keep an open mind don't, don't just look at the legal issues that you're facing and how to address those but look at the wider societal issues that might be you might be hearing about or recognizing as part of the issue that that individual is facing. Also, again, in those environments, make sure you're sharing your learnings with the other students that it might be, uh, be acting as advisors at the at law centers, etc. Make sure that you don't just 
if there's a good idea or something works or you hear about something on one of those calls that could make a difference to other people that you make it, you share it with the team. So I think, but it's definitely thing of something I would encourage. It's something that I did and it can really make a difference for people on in poverty trap, suffering with landlord and tenant issues and so on. So all power to you if you are involved in those centres. Okay, yeah, some, some good advice there for the students in today's webinar. Uh, I think we'll take a final question um, and that is, how does a university work with business to ensure that their work culture will cope with a diverse workforce? If we are working to increase diversity in areas such as apprenticeships, how do we as a university of opportunity ensure that the workplace enables and supports their development rather than unintentionally blocking, limiting their development? Any tips or guidance you can provide? So I know there's a lot there, but I think you got the gist of that, didn't you, Sandra? <laughs> I did. Um... Uh, might be one more for the university. I mean, for me, the the the, the apprenticeship scheme is an excellent scheme, and uh, it's it's something. There are <laughs> there are many flaws, but it's apprenticeships are really important. Not everyone wants to go to university that you can have um, higher uh, apprenticeships, but not everyone wants to go to university. Some people want to be earning, learning on the job. For me, um, universities can play their part in publicising what's available with um, apprenticeships helping to challenge the government about how they can make the apprenticeship route more attractive. Um, the courses that we, that we can make sure our courses are relevant to those on apprenticeships. And so really, from, uh, perhaps let the, the university come back on some of that, but really it is a, mat a matter of fine tuning our offering to ensure that people from socioeconomic backgrounds, diverse socioeconomic backgrounds can access those opportunities and access their learning they need to progress in their careers. Thanks, Sandra. So I don't know, um, Jeff. Uh, do you want to come on? Do you want to come on that one? Come back on that one. Just say a few words. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that. And then our law school, as you know, is something that does run an apprenticeship program. Yeah. Um, I think I think what's really really important about this is that there's not just one way into a career. There's different ways into a career, and people 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 <clears throat> people can be later developers people may not have had an opportunity at the right moment in time like, in terms of how education is structured and we've got to make sure that people have got the opportunity whenever it's ready for them to actually access different professions to, to make a real difference because it's own it's only and i love the concept that sandra that you, you said early on about um and these are my words, not your words. So you said it far more eloquently um, about you didn't feel you belonged in the sense of uh, the imposter culture type concept. And, and that comes across many of us who, who went to you know, polytechnics for our original degrees, et cetera, and the way in which they were seen. And the transformation that's taken place is immense. And we have to, we will see in years to come how valued the apprenticeship route is for, for some people as opposed to others. You know, it's not long ago, and it was in, certainly in my lifetime, that lawyers, accountants, electrical engineers, they studied at night school. Right? They had jobs and they studied at night school, and then they went into the profession. And what we've got now is a mix of those routes. And it's really important that we don't say one route is better than another route, they're just different and you have to value that difference and value that diversity really really important that new schemes that are there to reflect on that Michal runs apprentices as you know you may want to say a bit more but and that, that's where I would come from and thank you Sandra so much that was brilliant my pleasure so Michal do you have a few words on the no, I'm an enthusiast for um apprenticeships in general and legal apprenticeships in particular and I think they are an absolutely vital alternative route for people and Sandra's absolutely right some people simply cannot contemplate the idea of not earning um, as they study and we have to have those routes available to people to ensure that they can access the professions as well. Okay thanks Michal. So Sandra, I'm conscious of time. We're coming right uh, up to seven o'clock. Um, so once again, on behalf of the university, 
on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Jeff Blair, and on behalf of everyone, I just want to thank you so much for today, taking the time out of you know your busy schedule to address what certainly is a very, very important topic agenda for the university, but the sector, uh, across the sector. Uh, many thanks to all of the, the audience who joined us today. Um, and we look forward and we hope this will be one of many events in the future. But as a university, we really look forward to, um, you know, um, working with you. And thank you to everyone today who've been participating in this webinar. So from that, uh, we will now um, close the webinar. And once again, thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening.